are we? Okay, so welcome again to another episode of Shannon Channel. Uh, today I'm very happy to have Anand Sarwade uh, with us from uh, Rutgers University. And also at the same time we have Sri joining us live from UCSD and Anushi and Swaran from Texas A&M, so I'm really happy that they are here too. And I'm really excited about uh, Anand's talk, who's going to talk about uh, uh, from local to distributed differential privacy, and as he just said, he has Laplace watching over him, so I hope Laplace will bless all of us. <laughs> so, Anand, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, that's Laplace. Uh, wait, uh, I can do this. It's reversed, though. Okay, anyway, he's up there. Um, so Laplace will appear uh, very briefly in uh, my presentation today. Let me just share the screen. <clears throat> uh, start screen share. All right, are the slides visible? I assume yes. Yeah, slides are visible? OK. Great. Uh, uh, thanks for the invitation. And uh, I'm happy to give this talk on uh, local and distributed differential privacy. I guess the distributed should be in smaller uh, font because I don't have as much to say there yet. Um, but what I mean by these local and distributed problems, I'm thinking about problems in data sharing. And the challenge here is that you have uh, you want to collaborate. You have different parties who want to collaborate when one or more of them have sensitive information. So on the left side, you see a situation where you might have a hospital which has the private data of patients, and you have a researcher who wants to ask questions or, or you know query this database or get some do some analysis on that data. Or in the right side, you might have a situation where you have multiple institutions which are all possibly sharing data with each other or sharing access to data with each other. Uh, in order to solve problems like doing collaborative research, which is a problem um, application domain which I'm interested in, so multiple research groups studying the same disease, for example, needing to share data, uh, or problems in resource allocation where they need to collectively make a, some sort of decision. <clears throat> so one way of phrasing this problem is a problem of, sort of privacy versus access. So this data is private, but we want to provide some access. So one view that people have taken of this is that the person who wants to use the data, that is, who wants access to the data, you know, Perhaps they want statistical information, so they would like to understand things about uh, the data that are in your, you know, in this data set, and they, what they want really is kind of a proxy or approximation of the data that's useful for them. So maybe they want synthetic data, or maybe they want um, uh, uh, to build a model based on that data, right? And so a computer scientist, or you know, might say, okay, well, give me the set of questions you want to ask. And what I'll do is try to make a synthetic data set, or maybe find answers to these questions. And I'll structure my answers in such a way that the inference, inference about the original data based on the answers is difficult. And also uh, that you'll get reasonably accurate answers. That's the sort of guarantee. A statistician might say, oh, well, I'll just take a look at the data. And what I'll do is I'll fit a sufficiently complicated model subject to however many samples I have and how many parameters that I can fit. And that summarizes what I think is the important structure in the data. And then uh, I'll just give you this, which is effectively like giving you some probability distribution, uh, you know, parameterized by some theta. And I'll say, okay, you know, now you have the distribution. Basically, you know everything that I have learned about the data. So <clears throat> both of these ideas basically look at a kind of uh, sanitization that creates synthetic data process, uh, which is similar to the kind of curated access model, where you have. Um, this private data, you have a box which will take that private data and manipulate it in some way and then produce something which is uh, uh, either a probability distribution from which you can sample new data or this synthetic data. And so a lot of the work in this direction is focused on finding techniques and specific algorithms for specific tasks. Um, and it's useful in this hospital context that I mentioned before, where really you have somebody who's asking the questions and getting, and you're providing the answers as the designer of the system. And what happens in all of these models, and it is sort of unavoidable in, in most privacy models, is that you have this increase in privacy risk. The more questions you answer, the more you reveal about the, the underlying data, so the easier it is to infer things, sensitive things about individuals in the data set. This is contrasted to a different setting, which I'm going to talk a little bit about um, in this talk today, uh, which is a situation where actually what you need to do is produce a public version of the private data. And a, other, a lot of other people have worked on this model. This has got a rich history, actually, in official statistics, um, you know, government statistics, and, and in other fields. And the data uh, somehow is considered private after pro doing some pre-specified manipulations. So, like, maybe you'll quantize values so that they, they take on, um, you coarsen the values such that uh, 
there, there's less resolution in certain entries or you know, do other kinds of manipulations like that. Um, there are terms suppression, uh, imputation, generalization, generalization, these kind of uh, terms get used in this setting. And this is actually the de facto legal standard in many settings and they call it you know, anonymization. This is a bit misleading because there are a lot of uh, well-publicized attacks on this data, some of which I'll discuss in a, in a bit. And uh, so the real question is, how can we measure privacy and usefulness and the trade-off between privacy and utility in this setting, right? That's the kind of question I'm interested in, in uh, thinking about. Um, so the uh, other uh, thing is, uh, in, in distributed problems, there's also a difference between sharing models, uh, like in the, the statisticians problem, versus sharing the data. In this talk, I'm actually going to focus only on kind of learning models jointly. Um, and as a mini disclaimer, in my distributed part of my talk, I'm really just going to talk about a centralized method, a non-distributed method, which we are using in a decentralized setting. But in this line of work, what I'm interested in is how do we structure our inference methods or our learning methods to avoid excess privacy loss. Now, the, the, because we have this, this process by every time you send information about the data, you lose more and more privacy, um, a lot of the methods, like iterative methods that we, we adopt without privacy to solve learning problems sort of seem maybe wasteful from a privacy perspective. Okay, so for the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about differential privacy, um, uh, connection to, to rate distortion or formulation for this, this data publishing model via rate distortion, and then talk a little bit about some recent work on uh, learning low dimensional representations, principal components analysis. Um, just a couple of disclaimers for this talk. Uh, I will not talk about other privacy models and measures, even though they're out there. Um, in particular, I'm not going to talk about information theoretic methods, which is kind of ironic, given that we're in a, you know, Shannon channel talk. So sorry about that. I know it's even Shannon's birthday this weekend, so I feel doubly bad about that. Um, and then there's this problem with talks on differential privacy. I guess given the crowd that's here right now, maybe you're not... Uh, you know, haven't gone to too many talks on differential privacy already. Um, so I will introduce the basics of differential privacy, definitions, and so on. If you're interested in more tutorial material, uh, you can check out um, these references at the bottom. There's a Foundations and Trends book by Dwork and Roth, and the Simons Institute and Dimax both have videos, and uh, IHP will also have videos coming up. Um, and as another part of the disclaimer, I won't give a comprehensive literature review. Uh, so lots of references may be missing. They may be found in um, both the book and some of these other talks. Uh, the other thing is that it's a little bit uh, maybe tricky here, but I guess Salim promised that he'll ask questions. So interactive communication is significantly better than one-way communication. And I like questions even if I don't know how to answer them. So um, feel free to uh, jump in. OK, moving along. Uh, let's talk about differential privacy. What is differential privacy? Um, since I can't see any hands, it's a little weird giving a talk like this. Uh, I can't tell if everybody's uh, like, oh, I already know. But uh, one thing about pinning down a definition of privacy, it's difficult because the word privacy is overloaded in English, uh, and so we don't really have a... There are many ways that one might think about the word privacy, so differential privacy is just one, one of these approaches. So the motivation for thinking about differential privacy is that there's wide number of, a large number of attacks which have been made on uh, people who have tried to publish data which they thought they had anonymized. Um, uh, there are three examples that um, often come up in this context. One is uh, this one on the left, which is uh, from a paper by Latanya Sweeney, where uh, what was published were aggregates of discharge records from a hospital um, and what she did is bought for $20 a voter registration list. It seems appropriate given the time of the year right now. Um, and uh, then they contained some common entries, zip code, birth date, and sex, and from that she could identify that the governor of Massachusetts had been to a hospital on a certain day and was, had a certain procedure done. Uh, that's because zip code, birth date, and sex alone by themselves as, as a combination are um, uh, uniquely identifying for a large number of people in the population at least in the United States. Uh, the other major example that people often cite is this Netflix example, uh, where Netflix published data for part of the net as part of the Netflix contest, and then this was linked to IMDB in order to identify that somebody was a Netflix customer. So both of these are sort of examples of linking auxiliary data that's out there to 
uh, well-intentionedly, you know, the, the data that was anonymized in a well-intentioned way. And then the uh, third uh, example is <clears throat> about deciding, trying to determine whether a person was a member or was a part of the genome-wide association study. So the idea is if you have uh, sequencing information from an individual and you have the uh, GWAS data, and the GWAS data is um, what it pr publishes is frequencies of allelic variations at, at points in the genome, so whether people have different uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms, how many people have variant A versus variant B, for example. Um, you, can, you can actually infer whether somebody, with reasonable reliability, whether somebody was in the study or not, right? And so uh, this is, again, inferring the, the presence of somebody in the data bit, database. So what do we want to protect? I think that's really the question in, when you talk about privacy. What privacy is protecting something. So these examples show that the data itself is inherently identifying. So there's no, often we cannot think of a separation if we're thinking about publishing data in some way. Um, it's not like there are certain things like your name and your social security number which are the identifying aspects uh, and uh, identifying features and the other ones are not identifying because zip code, birth date, and sex is identifying. So a lot of uh, the focus in privacy-preserving data analytics has been on, well, can we learn statistical properties? That is, can we learn something about the population while still guaranteeing, uh, guaranteeing privacy? Because what I care about is not individuals. What I care about is the population. Another uh, thing uh, here is that uh, the published outputs from these examples, that the published outputs, whatever you publish from the data, the original private data, um, can allow some kind of reinference. So you can't, we shouldn't ask for too much. Uh, and that privacy is going to degrade over time, and what we're trying to, we need to try and quantify is, well, how hard is that reinference? Not, can we make that reinference impossible? Uh, and the, the last point, which is maybe actually the first point, is that we would like to make guarantees to individuals. That is, I would like to be able to guarantee to you that your data will be kept uh, private in some way, or that your participation in this research study on an embarrassing disease will be kept uh, confidential, um, and so this privacy should be guaranteed without depending on the privacy of other individuals. That is, if somebody else publishes, hey, I was in this embarrassing disease study, and they're friends with you on Facebook, or, and, or they publish it publicly on Facebook, you don't want their willy-nilly publishing of information about themselves to affect you. So how do we formalize this mathematically? So here are the ingredients, now we're getting to some math, so hopefully you can wake up now. Um, Okay, we need a data space. That is, we need a, we, so X is going to be the set of values in which uh, my data can take. And we also need like a notion of neighborhood relationship. That is, which is the sort of the notion of identifiability. So for two uh, individuals, you know, X with da one with data X and one with data X prime, I will write that X is a neighbor of X prime if they're, if they're, if they're neighbors, uh, actually, so I think of these as two databases, right? And so they're neighbors maybe if they differ in whether you were in the database or not. So one example is I might have n individuals, each of whom has a bit, and um, I'll say that they're neighbors if the Hamming distance is one. That's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> uh, and then I need an output space because what I'm going to do is publish something about the data. So here's my input data x, and then I'm going to have an output space y. And that's of course, depends on what we're trying to release. So for example, uh, maybe my data are real numbers, be, um, so I have n, n individuals with each of whom has a real number between 0 and 1, and I might want to compute the average, so the average, the output space is also between 0 and 1. A more complicated example, um, which we'll get to later, is I might want to compute uh, a k-dimensional subspace that well approximates my higher d-dimensional data, and I have n vectors in, in d dimensions, and so now the output set Y could be the set of k-dimensional subspaces. And what we'll see later is it actually matters, it can matter what you choose your Y to be, and thinking about what your Y should be is sometimes uh, an interesting question. And then finally, then what is an algorithm? That is, what is a privacy-preserving algorithm? Well, it's just a, a map from X to Y, right? And uh, it could be a deterministic map, or it could be like a channel that goes from X to Y. So what is differential privacy? Um, differential privacy is, is a framework in which I think of this mapping Q, this algorithm Q, as a being a randomized map or a channel. So the channel will guarantee uh, epsilon delta differential privacy if the 
output distribution under any input that is this conditional distribution is uh, close under both x and x prime when x and x prime are neighbors. So the idea that you want to think about is what's going on at the top of the slide here, which is I imagine there are two possible worlds, one in which x was the input to my channel and one in which x prime was the input to my channel. So I put them both through the channel. And uh, I'll get some output distribution. And these output distributions will be slightly different from each other, probably, um, but hopefully not too different from each other. So here, for example, these look like two Laplace distributions. Here's the Laplace thing uh, with slightly different means. What you get is actually one observation y, which could have come from x or could have come from x prime. And so you imagine there's an adversary who observes this y. This is the output of your algorithm, and then tries to infer, was it x that was uh, sent, or was it x prime that was sent? That's kind of the communication information theory view of things. And so they could form their best possible x hat. And so what you're trying, sorry, what you're trying to do is you're trying to bound the, the, the probabilities of error of inferring uh, of you know, x prime being x or uh, x hat being x or x prime. So these are like false alarm misdetection probability trade-offs. And in fact, that's exactly what uh, this uh, definition is guaranteeing. So this privacy parameter, or epsilon, in the previous slide is related to the hypothesis test between, um, um, say, H0, the null hypothesis being x, and the alternative hypothesis being x prime. And it constrains it in this way. It says that the false alarm misdetection probabilities, their weighted, a weighted average has to be you know, bigger than something. So the, this basically tells you that you can't achieve certain, in the, in the white region, you can't achieve those pairs of uh, false alarm misdetection probabilities. So this is a connection that was nicely articulated by Wasserman and Zhao, and then also in a paper by uh, Kairuz O and Vishwanath uh, more recently. Um, if you'll go back, we can see there's actually two parameters. There's an epsilon and a delta. This multiplicative factor is like e to the epsilon, um, and then there's this delta. So if delta was zero, I could like stick, I could divide both sides by the q and take logs, and then I'm basically saying the log likelihood ratio is less than epsilon, which from detection and estimation class or whatever you know is, you know, important. Small log likelihood ratio means difficult hypothesis test. And so you see it here. So you can also do the same uh, formulation with, uh, you get the same kind of uh, expression, but with deltas in it, if you consider the delta not equal to zero case. So far, so good? Okay. So what about this delta? So there's this approximate notion of epsilon delta differential privacy. And as I said, if, you, if we take delta equal to zero, we get this log likelihood ratio being less than epsilon. But it turns out that if you consider this delta parameter is actually quite, kind of significant. So it's not actually possible. I mean, if you take delta, um, you, know, you might say, oh, I'll just choose delta to be positive but uh, negligibly small. But it turns out that in, certain, in, in a lot of cases, um, even like small delta can make your algorithms not work very well. So here's an example. Um, connected to this principal components analysis thing that I'll, I'll talk about later, where you can see we're plotting the versus delta. We're sort of plotting the quality of our, um, of what the algorithm produces. And it varies a lot by data set. So for example, um, these are the same range of delta for two different data sets, the same epsilon, so the same privacy level I'm trying to guarantee with two completely different data sets. And I'm comparing, say, two algorithms and uh, on the left side, it's like uh, this AG algorithm is always better, and it's um, you know it's got a hundred percent. It's it's really good uh, regardless of what delta is, and then it turns out to have a quite a significant change uh, as I vary delta in the on the right side. So uh, on a on a different data set. So these are um, uh, it's hard to say a priori uh, what kind of delta you should choose. How does a, a differential privacy connect? This epsilon parameter so, connect. Yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. So can you go back to the previous slide? I, I yeah. trying to understand. I, I might have missed the point here. So, so epsilon you connected it to the log likelihood ratio. What is delta? What does delta mean? So delta, mm -hmm. if you go if you go back to this um, uh, this diagram here, delta will actually represent. Imagine that instead of connecting at the one zero and zero one points, the sort of hinged line, right? Yeah. Imagine it kind of pulled away from the from that, like a little bit down the axis. Okay. That so would, in terms of privacy, what does that mean? In terms of what? The privacy. Oh, in terms in of privacy, terms of basic. Oh, right. So the interpretation of delta is delta is the probability that your algorithm just you know fails. Oh, okay. 
So if you like, it's like a, it's kind of it's not quite the same as zero error versus like you know epsilon error, but like it's 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 like you see in a lot of these uh, analyses of randomized algorithms. There is a prob because it's randomized. There's a probability that the algorithm fails. That probability is delta. You'd like to think that delta is going to be, you know, very small. But what okay. I'm trying to show in this figure is that um, actually choosing delta to be very small can be very bad in some cases. It's, it depends somehow on data on the actual data that you have. And it's not actually clear that you can choose. Some people will tell you that you can choose delta to be very small and don't worry about it. But I guess I, from from the trenches of doing, um, you know, working with some real data sets, I would say that's not the case. And and the reason is that you can set it to be very small, but this is going to affect the accuracy of your. Yeah, exactly. You can set it to be very small, and then yeah, that you'll just essentially produce garbage, okay. or start to produce garbage. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, for delta equals 0, we have a nice characterization of the relationship between mutual information and, um, and uh, epsilon. And that if I look at the mutual information between x and y, if I think now of the, in, the, in the way that the problem is formulated, my input x is not random. There's no distribution on x. I just have these two hypotheses. The channel is producing the randomness. But if I think about choosing any distribution p of x on the set of databases x, then if my channel guarantees epsilon differential privacy, then the mutual information is always less than epsilon. That's because what the, because basically the uh, epsilon is pr controlling point-wise this uh, um, log likelihood ratio. So um, in general, a good channel that's a good channel, say in a rate distortion sense, which has low rates, so low mutual information, is not going to have strong differential privacy properties. So that is, it's not actually the same channel which achieves uh, a good performance in both. And so here what I plotted actually is just a binary symmetric channel. So the x-axis is just the crossover probability of a binary symmetric channel. Um, I think, yeah. Somehow it's not quite connecting to 1. So I think this must be in Nats. Um, uh, so uh, the red line, or the, the, the orangish line, red, salmon colored line, is uh, the differential privacy uh, pr parameter epsilon. And then the mutual information, you know, corresponding to this channel, and then the mutual information, you know, say under uh, uh, brutally half input is, is is shown in blue. So you can see the gap gets worse and worse as you get closer and closer to being a, a noiseless channel. Um, so what are the kind of methods? How do we guarantee differential privacy? So the, this mapping, this this channel Q uh, has to be randomized, so there might involve noise somehow. Uh, so basically, it's like, where do I put the noise in the channel Q? So one idea is my mapping X to Y, but Q is like, add noise to X, then do some com fun function computation F that takes outputs in the right uh, output space. Or I could compute my function F and then add noise to it in the output space. Uh, or I could do some more complicated thing where I... Um, I have a sort of sampling box which takes in X and also the output alphabet Y and maybe some uh, quality function G of X, Y, which tells me uh, how good Y is for input X. And then I you know, randomly choose something which has a good utility, according to G, uh, on the set Y in a way that guarantees differential privacy. So the combinations of these methods and other methods are kind of along the same lines have been used to, to propose methods for uh, all sorts of statistical quantities, like averages, argmaxes, point estimates for parameter estimation, histograms, you know, classification regression, and uh, low-rank approximation, things like decision trees. You can start thinking about more complicated algorithms in which you substitute different uh, differentially private uh, steps in uh, different places to sort of make the whole thing, whole thing overall differentially private. Um, so that's kind of uh, where a lot of the uh, application uh, touching uh, stuff ends up, uh, the research goes. Um, it, differential privacy has two properties. It's actually kind of useful for building algorithms in this way. Uh, one is kind of a data processing inequality, which sometimes goes by the name of post-processing invariance. So that's on the top branch here. If X goes into an algorithm which guarantees epsilon 1 differential privacy and produces an output Y1, then if I take any mapping G, it could be randomized or deterministic as long as it doesn't depend on X except through Y, so there's a Markov chain X, Y, Z. Um, then the 
privacy loss, uh, the differential privacy that is if I look at a channel, aggregate channel X to Z, that also guarantees epsilon one differential privacy. Uh, I could guarantee better. I mean, I could use G could also like destroy information, but uh, at worst, it's going to be epsilon one differentially private. So that sort of makes sense. Um, then if I have two, uh, if I put X through two different algorithms, one with epsilon one and one with epsilon two, uh, with different output spaces, then the you know, aggregate output X to say Z1 and Z, or Y1 and Y2, that thing guarantees at most epsilon one plus epsilon two differential privacy. You can get, um, you can get a better guarantee uh, if you relax to epsilon delta differential privacy because if you think about it, actually the actual, maybe the actual privacy risk is itself a random variable so you can exploit sort of the randomness in the actual realized epsilon to kind of prove a concentration result about what you're, what you're guaranteeing. Um, so there's some more details in the references below there. Um, and again, this would require, of course, requires uh, moving from epsilon zero to epsilon delta differential privacy. Okay, so what are kind of privacy utility trade-offs in this in this framework? So let's consider a case where uh, you know I have binary data, um, and uh, with you know, and I say two databases are neighbors if they differ in one bit. That is, two individuals you know differ in one bit. If uh, then if I add Laplace noise then I could compute the, uh, to the average of these uh, x's, of, of the input x. This actually is an epsilon differentially private estimate of the mean. The, the amount of noise, is the parameter of the Laplace distribution is one over n epsilon. So you can see here, as epsilon gets small, that's privacy risk, um, I'm leaking less information, but I have to add more noise. And as n gets large, I'm add, uh, I can add less noise. So this kind of corresponds to our intuition about, you know, um, Large sample sizes mean uh, more privacy, and um, large, uh, small, a uh, small privacy risk uh, means entails making things noisier. The variance of this noise is, uh, you know, two over n squared epsilon squared. So as the number of samples n increases, we have stronger evidence for, say, structure that is, or stronger evidence for um, an, you know, our estimate of the parameter. So if in particular, if I thought about, if I wanted to compute, the reason I might want to compute the average of these x's is I might just want to know the average number of people who have one in the population, right? Um, so my variance will will uh, decrease with the number of samples, um, and so I'll have less privacy risk. This uh, trade-off then is this privacy utility trade-off. So I can specify an epsilon and then evaluate kind of what my expected error uh, is going to be. Uh, so this uh, motivates. Uh, so this is actually this is what I was going to talk about for differential privacy in in you know basic definitions, and then I'll move on to the next part of the talk, which is some joint work uh, with Lalita uh, Shankar and uh, her student Kusha uh, Kalantari, who's actually also working with Oliver Kosut. So, um, and this is uh, stuff that uh, we're going to present uh, at ISIT. Um, so I want to start with uh, we we you know, before we're talking in this example that I just did. I said all we really care about is the parameter of the distribution, uh, essentially the that is the average number of ones. That's so kind of like saying, oh, if my data was IID Bernoulli p, what's p, right? That's that's kind of the estimation problem that I was doing there. And then that sample mean is the ML estimate of uh, p. And then what I'm saying is add noise to the ML estimate. Um, but it turns out that uh, I don't need to add noise to the sum. I could just kind of actually let every, uh, I could actually push the privacy guarantee down to the level of individual data points. Um, so this is a surveying problem. Um, and so in the surveying problem, a surveyor is asking individuals for their data and wants to estimate this parameter. Of the, and what they want to do is estimate the parameter of the population, exactly the problem I mentioned before. So you have these people. Um, uh, you know, n people uh, and the surveyor, and the surveyor is not trusted. You can tell because he has these creepy sunglasses, um, and so and he wants to compute some function of the data, right? Which is going to be my estimator of the parameter. So if I want to find, say, the average number of drug users in the population, then again, I had this example I had before. Each xi is zero or one, and I want to compute the average, right? So this is a pretty classical example. But now it's different, a little bit different than the problem I said before, because before. Uh, each individual, the individuals kind of trusted the surveyor, and the surveyor is making a guarantee that what they publish is going to be 
uh, private. Uh, here, the individuals don't even trust the surveyor, right? So that's a uh, that's like, you know, you go around knocking on people's doors, right? So this is a problem that came up in public health, uh, and Warner in 1965 proposed this idea of randomized response, which is a pretty classical uh, now technique for eliciting uh, answers from people in this scenario. And this is actually basically the same idea as, as di that differential privacy is, is, is doing. And in fact, it's, the, you know, the same, more or less. So what, in, what Warner said is give each individual a biased coin uh, to flip privately, and you tell them to lie if it comes up heads, right? And people actually will follow this protocol as long as the bias of the coin is kind of close to half. So now you think of these n bits of these individuals as essentially going through a binary symmetric channel with some crossover probability that I know, because I know the bias of the coin, and then they, everybody basically may or may not be lying to the surveyor. So here's my binary symmetric channel. So what I'll do is I'll just compute my estimator, that is, I'll compute my average uh, on, on the uh, noisy values, um, and then I'll correct for the bias. I'll just look at the expectation, uh, which is going to be a function of Q and the true under, underlying uh, population uh, distribution P, and then I'll just, you know, just do a little algebra and solve for it. So, as n gets large, you, again, the estimation error goes to zero in this case, and now you have an even stronger privacy guarantee where everybody's gotten a chance to lie to the surveyor. So um, this is what they, what, what's called local privacy because everybody's guaranteed privacy at this local level. So this actually corresponds to the problem that it, it does arise in practice, which is the, the person who actually has to share ver a version of their data. If I have n records, I have to share n records. Um, I can't share some model of my n records, right? So uh, the institution holding xn wants to release a version of the data x hat while guaranteeing privacy. And so then that output is going to be observed by an adversary and is trying to figure out, uh, say, for any individual in the data set, what their value is. So for example, I might want to publish a version x hat n of the data such that the Hamming distortion to the original is small. So that is. Uh, that, that would sort of make sense, and that's sort of the utility guarantee. That is, I'd like to publish a version that is, is as accurate as possible um, on average, but, uh, but where each person gets to sort of might have been perturbed uh, randomly. So this seems pretty, like, you know, nothing fancy going on here. So randomized response also solves the data sharing problem. I just shove my data through a channel. Um, and this gives a distortion, of course, that's and basically the crossover of this binary symmetric channel, right, with high probability. So that's what we know from information theory. So you can sort of generalize this problem, right? I have data, which uh, is, uh, I think, of as, as model as Xn. And what I'll think of, as opposed to the regular differential privacy model, I'll think of it as being coming from a distribution, that's IID from some distribution P, that lives in a class script P. So um, that is, I have some uncertainty because if what I want to do, you know, if I what I might want to do in the end is infer the distribution p, then I kind of don't need to know anything about. Um, then I don't, I don't like need the data itself, right? So here we're sort of providing a little bit of extra uncertainty. And what the database owner is going to do is they're going to basically run some kind of randomized response, you know, memorylessless, memorylessly. Right, uh, over the data xn, and it produces x hat n. So I just shove one by one into this channel, and hopefully this channel will guarantee epsilon dp or epsilon differential privacy, right? And uh, the goal is then to figure out, well, what kind of distortions can I get universally over the class script p? Um, so I can call a channel epsilon dp locally private if uh, on letter by letter basis. Now here my script x is not a, a the database size, but it's a it's an individual size. I wanted to guarantee the epsilon zero differential privacy guarantee. And then I can say, okay, script QDP is the set of all channels guaranteeing epsilon DP differential privacy. And then I can say, okay, what's the worst distortion over my class P? Well, if I want to fix an epsilon, then I say, okay, uh, find me the best channel Q, and then I'll take the worst distribution P. And then that's my sort of uh, max min uh, distortion. Or I could say, phrase it, and I could phrase basically the problem as find me the best privacy risk or find me the lowest epsilon that I can guarantee subject to a distortion constraint D. That's kind of the flip, flip version of, uh, of, the, of the blue problem. 
And this is kind of the privacy distortion trade-off for this class. So the idea is I want to, you know, not universally, but like, you know, robustly over the source class guarantee uh, target distortion. Um, so my, my representation is pretty good while still making sure that uh, each individual record is protected with this differential privacy guarantee. So far, so good? I don't, I have yeah. a question. Oh, very good. I understood the surveying problem, but I've kind of lost the model here. Uh, what is the problem here? Okay, so the problem, kind of lost... right, the problem here is I have data XN. And but you're I surveying? Or you I'm surveying, surveying. I, I'm surveying, right? I'm acting like the surveyor in the sense that I'm going to every I'm going to publish a version letter by letter of this underlying data. And each each survey, so the XN is not each user is giving you XN. Each you have n users. I have n users. I have n users, each of whom is going to perturb uh, via this channel. Okay, and then and I don't know the distribution p ahead of time, so I'm going to design this channel ahead of time. Right. And what I want okay. is I want actually my data to have kind of good fidelity to the original data. Good it's, fidelity in rate distortion manner. In, in a rate distortion in a distortion manner. There's no rate here at this point, right? Okay. But then how would you relate it to the epsilon differential privacy? So the channel Q is the epsilon, is guaranteeing this epsilon letter by letter. So you want you want because that's uh, this uh, that's this definition here, right? So I'm saying it's le epsilon locally private. So in, in addition to this, you want minimum, dist so I'm just yeah. having to. Right, so uh, if, I, if I just wanted to be the max, maximum private, right, I would just map everything to one letter and then, you know, okay. publish nothing, right? So then I've guaranteed all the privacy that I want, right? So the question is, what is. That can be the guarantee, this epsilon DP, you want the one that has, that is closely least distorted. Corresponding yeah, period. the least, so I want to find either for a fixed epsilon, what's the best distortion I can get? Over, regardless of the source, right? Okay. So, and and this is uh, inter if you're interested in a function of this data, would this uh, guarantee well, so this minimum? Well, then then you have to relate the distortion. Then you have to have like some kind of notion of the continuity with respect to the dis. Then you're you're saying, oh well, you know, how close? If I give you something that's within uh, d distortion of the original, will that, how does that relate to the value of my function? If what you want to compute is just one function, then you can probably do something smarter than this, right? But what if I don't know what function you want to compute? And so, so let's do this. So if you don't know what function, is this the best way to, to solve this problem? I mean, is this the best formula, or this is a good formulation? Uh, well, I don't, want to, I don't want to be hubristic. So I, I think uh, it, it is a way of formulating the problem. <laughs> um, is it the best? I don't know. I mean, the thing is that if, if you know a lot about the, the problem is um, we, we're faced with these scenarios in which people don't know what they want to do with the data yet. Right? So distortion is kind of a proxy for uh, this is a reasonable version of the data. Okay. Right? Um, which we think of as, you know, but as we know, for example, mean squared error is not a very good measure of perceptual distortion in video. Right? That's right. But yet everybody still uses mean squared error. Why? Because we don't really have a good me measure for perceptual quality in video. Okay. So, oh, so no, like no, in this no. sense, in this sense, in this sense, distortion is a proxy for I don't know what function you want to compute. So here's something that's at least close. Or can we ask a different question? What are the functions that this would be a good proxy for? Well, I mean, certainly this uh, certainly this will still uh, this will still work for things like point estimation. Like if you want to estimate a parameter of the distribution, okay. Because essentially the mechanisms that we are looking at here, at least in certain classes, so we have results for kind of like just Hamming distortion at the moment. But um, you can imagine for other other scenarios, you can you can show that this um, <clears throat> this guarantees good uh, you know parameter estimation properties. Okay. Uh, I think, but I mean, the thing is, it also depends on the distortion measure, right? True, true, true. Yeah. I mean, I'm assuming. Uh, Hamming. E, e, yeah, well, so the, you're assuming Hamming because uh, that's what I'm going to uh, also that's what I'm going to talk about. But you know, actually, things like log loss actually would be quite kind of interesting in this setting, and various other, you know, various other things, uh, other distortion measures actually might be kind of more inferentially relevant. Mm. Depends on the class of things you want to do. 
the point we were trying to make is that, oh, well, you know, what we do, what we do often in ap applications where we don't know what function people want to compute or how people want to measure quality is we use distortion as kind of a crutch, right, to let us say something about an optimization problem. And then, uh, you know, then we can look at what kind of distortion measures are good, what, when it guarantees certain distortions, what kind of accuracy will they let me guarantee, and so on and so forth. So far? So good? Uh, yeah. This is Arun. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Can you explain this uh, maximum formulation again? I, I Okay, so the idea is I don't know the distribution script. I don't know which distribution my data is coming from. Yeah. When I pick when I pick my channel Q. Mm-hmm. So I can for a fixed P and a fixed Q, I can calculate what the distortion is going to be. Right? I'm 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 struggling whether it should be a max min or a min max. I don't know why I'm thinking it should be a min max. Uh oh maybe it should be a min max. Maybe my maybe my slide is incorrect here. Um Uh, well, let's see. Uh, I get to pick. You have to pick the channel first, and then somebody gets to pick the. Uh, and then somebody gets to pick the the distribution. See, because in in scenarios where you don't know the p, uh, you will let the adversary pick the worst, right? So I was thinking it should be min max. Right, so ah, but I have to guarantee. What if the Q that I what if for the Q that I pick? Your goal is to your goal is to ensure that the differential privacy is good for the worst channel, right? No, it's, no. My goal is to show that the different the differential privacy does not depend on the source, right? So that's one thing. I mean, it anyway doesn't depend on the source because source right. distribution doesn't come into picture at all. Right. Yeah. So uh, I need to guarantee that it holds for every p in p. So you want to you want to yes, you q. want to minimize the distortion, right? Yes. So maybe it should be min max. But by choosing q, right? Hmm. No. This, this function q is the thing that you you get to choose, right? Yeah, yeah. I get to choose q. Yeah. So you want to minimize this distortion, but now what's the best that you can do? I mean, what's the best that the adversary can do is worse in terms of the distribution for this minute. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But, but you want to so do you're it maximizing for the worst. this over p, maximizing this the best that you can do. I, uh, it, you can define it in both no, ways. No, no, no. See, I guess. see. In, uh, so let's let's um, uh, let me contrast this to uh, when you're trying to do maybe estimation or something of that sort. You don't know the uh, you don't know the distribution by nature, so you want to you want to design an estimator that uh, does uh, best when you take the worst uh, distribution, right? So in this case, the nature is the population, and I want to design. So I don't know the population. So for different population, so I take a particular uh, 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 mechanism Q. It has a particular performance for a P. And I want to minimize the distortion that that DP the the uh, the property of the mechanism doesn't depend upon the distribution at all. So I, I can hit it with any p. So I seem to want to minimize the max because well, the no no here here the inside function the, it's a maximization of a function o over p. So already chosen for channel q. And you're yeah. not in the worst case distortion that that channel provides. that that channel can 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 can. You, uh, you want to find the channel? You why do you already you have to find the Q? You, you have already found the Q. Now then you are trying to uh, uh, what you are trying to do is an analysis equation where you are trying to find out what is the worst case distortion for that channel. So you are trying to uh, solve the adversary's problem. No, it's not analysis. It's just an analysis. It's just it's for the analysis. For your chosen channel, what is the maximum? Read the sentence. So, uh, what is your design? Your design is Q or P? Is is Q, right? So Q has to for every distribution P. So Q. then, then your delta function is going to be a function of Q, right? 
I mean, the, the real way to formulate this is actually to, to say, the, the, the better way, a better way to phrase this is let me define the set of all channels Q, mm -hmm. uh, which guarantees distortion uh, D for all, uh, target distortion D for all P in uh, script P. Right, then I want to essentially find, Oh no no, hang on. So sorry, that, that's that's the second equation. Um, sorry, I miss. You're looking at the the delta, the definition of delta, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah my, so my design is Q. So I'd like to choose a Q, which uh, in this set, um, and for a fixed. So let's see. Let's suppose we did min max, right? Because uh, if I did min max, then uh, I would say. Uh, for any Q, uh, here is the worst distortion that I can get over the over the over the set P. And so let me find a Q which minimizes this worst distortion, which I think is actually correct. So if I if I do min max, what I can so if my min max if the argument of the min max give me a Q gives me a Q star, then I can claim that the Q star uh, has a particular performance that I can get in no matter what the P is. Yeah, yeah, I think actually I have this backwards in my slides. I have to go back and look at the paper to check. I think if we want to design Q with Max is a... Then you have proper mm -hmm. solution. Mm -hmm. We just want to analyze the discuss that for your... This, yes. this equation is not used to design Q, is that right, uh, Anand? Yeah, no, I'm not using it to design Q. I'm using it to define epsilon star. Yeah. yeah. But then but then final, finally your goal is what? Design Q or what? It is. Find me a Q which gets has the best epsilon. Okay, let's keep going. Maybe you'll understand. Well, actually, I don't know if it will become clearer later, but... <laughs> is, it clean, is it clear for you? Yes, I, but I... You, Anand, you can comment on the YouTube video later if, <laughs> if there is. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll have to. Maybe I'll have to provide an annotation later to, to comment because uh, now you've raised enough confusion in in my um, stare. Like now that I'm staring at, I'm like maybe you're right. Maybe it should be min max. But so I'm not. Well, I'm not phrasing this. I'm not phrasing this as an optimization problem. I'm just defining what is the worst uh, distortion over p. Is this. That's that's true for sure. No, but this is a function of yeah, yeah, Q. Yeah, I know. But worst case, see the left hand is, side, the is delta right. is a function of Q. No, it's not because I minimized but over Q already. No, no, that is if you pull it out, because you. No, you have a class of uh, Qs. So right, there's a class of Qs. So I've already. I'm saying for all the Qs which guarantee me epsilon differential privacy. No, so it's just a function, and that is just a function of epsilon. So that's a, so. That class itself is a function of epsilon, so right. it's not really a function. Yeah, uh, yeah, we don't want to interrupt, so maybe, yeah, you can. Sorry. No, it's okay. No, that's fine. Uh, you know, it's good. It's better than uh, better than just me talking to myself in this room. Although it's, I don't want to run too far over here. So, okay, so we're looking. We basically looked at two different simple baby classes of sources, one in which basically I don't really care about the label of the sources. So if any, I just basically care about the probabilities. So which we call permutation invariant. So if I take the set of probabilities and I kind of assign them to any of the letters, it's kind of you know, symmetric about the uniform distribution but doesn't have to contain the uniform distribution. Uh, then that's like one class. And, and one particular thing here is that I'm not taking, this, isn't, this, this uh, set of distributions is not convex. So, um, And then I could just think about things where uh, I look at the, the probabilities are ordered. So Element one is always uh, more probable than element two, and so on and so forth. And we call that ordered statistics. So we kind of can analyze these two cases uh, somewhat. Uh, the first one completely, and the second one somewhat. Um, under Hamming distortion. Uh, so this is discrete sources under Hamming distortion. And uh, they give a little bit of insight, I think, into, into what's going on in this data publishing problem. So how does this relate to actually to previous things? And maybe this will get to the problem, the question that Salim asked. Uh, so Kairos et al. For, uh, kind of, uh, so Kairos Owen Bishonath formulated a um, abstract privacy utility trade-off uh, under local differential privacy, in which um, they're looking at kind of the max 
utility over the class of epsilon differentially private mm, uh, channels. And they said, oh, my utility function is sublinear if essentially it scales and is, you know, it, sublinear in this second bullet case. So u of q1 plus q2 is less than or equal to u of q1 plus u of q2. So lots of examples of functions uh, that they, they, they give, which are sublinear for in terms of estimators and so on. And what they showed basically is that uh, in these kind of scenarios, randomized response or a form of randomized response or something what they call staircase mechanisms are kind of optimal. So that is uh, Q looks like it's got one value on the diagonals and different values off the diagonals. And it depends, of course, you can change the output space, but basically it has these sort of two value uh, structures. Um, so it turns out actually for our, you know, worst case distortion over this class P, it's not actually sublinear in the sense uh, that they, um, they have. So essentially, this is just to say, oh, our results are not actually a typical corollary of their results. Um, but it turns out, actually, you know, so we're actually kind of curious. So maybe the staircase mechanism is still optimal. That is, randomized response is still the best thing to do. Um, and then, of course, what kind of distortions can we get? And then maybe how does the channel vary with the distortion? Um, so uh, what we can do is for this class where I don't care about the labeling of the source, so this permutation invariant uh, source class, uh, we can characterize what the optimal privacy risk is for a target distortion level D. And it has a very nice form. And um, it's a staircase mechanism, so it has exactly the structure. You just have to pick the values in order to make this uh, equation work out. Um, and I guess one thing to note is that if your distortion level is pretty big, uh, you can basically, that is your distortion target is very big, then, you know, essentially outputting something with zero mutual information is 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 good enough. That is, you can publish something which is sort of useless. Um, and then given any target D, what you can do is construct a staircase mechanism which achieves a, a better epsilon, so that as we sort of provide a construction uh, to improve the epsilon and then show, uh, show that it's optimal. Um, so... I might mm -hmm. have missed this, but uh, but which which Q achieves this? You probably mentioned it. Oh, it's it's the same the same as this kind of staircase mechanism. So it's got one value oh, in the diagonal. Yeah. yeah, it's like a symmetric channel. Although it's not sublinear, it's still the yeah, still we get mechanism. still we get the staircase mechanism. So like we're you know we're happy about that because staircase mechanisms are kind of nice. So. But are you yeah. saying you say you're right that we for any staircase me for any mechanism D we can construct staircase mechanism which achieve oh okay okay got yeah. It. So basically, you know, it's basically like, oh, your mechanism isn't so good after all. Here's a better one, you know. Here's a better staircase mechanism. So kind of staircase mechanisms are always better. So what is the what is the underlying kind of uh, implicit property that making these mechanisms optimal? Obviously, sublinearity is one of them. Yeah, and it's a symmetry. There's a symmetry to the problem, right? There's a symmetry to the problem here where. Uh, Especially in the in the late because here in this permutation invariant case, I don't care about the labeling. So mm -hmm. if my channel is good for this, for if you give me a, if I give if you yeah if I give you a channel, you're like oh it's good for my source, and then somebody else says oh I'm going to permute your labels, so now, uh, it also has to be good for that source, right? And that symmetry lets you get away with a lot. Okay. So that means basically everything off the diagonal has to be the same. Okay. And um, that's the. And that be. value you can, right? Hmm? That that value of the diagonal you can you can compute. I mean, yeah, then you compute it. Yeah, then you compute it. Yeah. Uh, for our statistics, it's a bit more complicated, and I didn't want to put up the theorem because it would take like three slides and not be very um, parsable. Uh, we can prove upper and lower bounds, um, and so in some cases we get a staircase uh, structure, and some for some ranges of distortion. What's interesting here is the output alphabet size changes as a function of the target distortion. So low probability uh, elements, we just ignore them At, as we get to higher distortion. I, sorry, there's a little typo here. Um, and so the lower bound idea, the prove a lower bound, uh, we get a sequence of transformations, much like we did before, and for uh, which basically um, it's, a, it's, a little, it's, a, it's a little involved maybe in a way that I, I think could be less involved, but I think there might be a cleaner proof somewhere out there, but um, and then for the upper bound, we basically you know say here's a staircase mechanism that achieves this uh, achieves this kind of performance. Um, so I think 
you know, it's kind of interesting. The 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 class of sources thing, I think, philosophically is interesting because it represents your uncertainty about about the world. And and what motivated this problem was the two 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 points. One is that sometimes you do have to publish something about the data, and often you know something about the data d distribution ahead of time. And so, how do we capture that in, into a model? Because differential privacy tends to ignore that sort of uh, that sort of information. Um, that's kind of what I wanted to say about this little toy example. I think there's a lot of interesting questions, kind of connecting, thinking about distortion. And again, like Salim asked, you know, is distortion the right way to think about this in terms of publishing uh, data? Um, so I guess I am a little little running over time, but let me uh, see if I can get through some of the rest of this. Should be a little bit faster. So um, I want to talk about sort of different aspect. It's kind of this is a bit of a Frankenstein talk, right? Where I stick two things together, um, but because I'm also interested in distributed problems. Um, so this is some work I've been doing with my student uh, Hafiz and uh, a bunch of other people, including my longtime collaborator uh, Kamalika, um, for some of the earlier work. And this is a very mu much more applications driven. So there's less there are no min maxes here to trip me up. So, um, so one thing I just maybe a couple of slight, slight philosophical points that I kind of brought up earlier is that uh, in a lot of distributed setups, you know, we, we think of kind of two. There are a lot of two two models that people think about maybe in practice. One is kind of a almost like a MapReduce version, right, where you have this sort of one shot. Different processors do a bunch of work, and then they send something to an aggregator, like the reduce step, who then sort of fuses the results, right? Um, and again, I'm not thinking about like sensor networks here, even though it looks, you know, if I took my figures from, uh, you know, n years ago when sensor networks were like, you know, people very exciting, more exciting for me to work on, then uh, you know, I could just do the same thing and just remove the data sets. Um, the other version is kind of. Uh, uh, more like a kind of consensus-based uh, view where you have these in, uh, individual nodes sending messages back and forth, and you kind of do this iterative procedure uh, in a fully decentralized way, uh, and then maybe the public gets the act, you know, reads the data, reads the result off of one of the nodes in the network. Um, one approach, both of these have problems because uh, in, or they, they both have. Uh, different trade-offs in terms of the amount of messaging that's going on and therefore the amount of privacy loss that you leak uh, through all of this messaging, right? And so one approach, for example, to lessen the burden of, um, of privacy leakage because every time you do some computation on private data, you leak some more epsilon is to kind of just do sequential processing. So you got a hot potato, the... Uh, um, the result around the around the network, and so he looked at a problem like this, for example, in um, in uh, stochastic gradient descent uh, procedures, um, and uh, there you can uh, you know you can optimize the order, so there are kind of questions that you can ask there in order to improve the guarantees. Um, but I think we need better analysis, maybe some, somewhat like the analysis around uh, Basili and Smith's paper, uh, to provide better guarantees in in this kind of uh, setting. Uh, the, the motivation for this uh, second part of this work is actually in neuroimaging. I'm working with people who work in sort of computational neuroimaging. And the idea there is you have each site has data from, say, a study on schizophrenia. And what they want to do is learn patterns across the population of the differences between, say, schizophrenics and non-schizophrenics. A sort of typical task in, the, in this world is to learn underlying latent features that are correlated with the disease, um, so kind of like a blind source separation problem. In fact, ICA, independent component analysis, is one approach that people use. So, um, you know, there are distributed approaches to doing independent component analysis or decentralized approaches to doing uh, principal, uh, independent component analysis. But a, a central part of that is doing principal component analysis locally. And so what we did is kind of working on this pre-processing step that can kind of really improve the performance of the distributed method. And so we're using kind of a... Uh, differential privacy there to guarantee some uh, consensus uh, across uh, sites. So principal component analysis, uh, maybe everybody is quite familiar with it, but I'll go through kind of quickly. The idea is that you have, say, n individuals, each of which, uh, this is my colorful slide, uh, with uh, d-dimensional real vectors. Um, but this fundamental structure is low dimensional, so the, the goal is to identify some latent structure in the data, like some kind of matrix factorization. In particular, maybe these latent factors, all these colors are linear combinations of red, green, and blue, so I just need to figure out what the mixing coefficients are between red, green, and blue 
to describe each of these vectors. Um, but okay, so then we have this problem now where I might want to do something like find these latent features, private principal component analysis, but I have an adversary who is uh, going to observe the output and, you know, maybe observes uh, some information about other individuals is trying to infer the data vector or the data value of the, the lady in the green sweater here. So what do people do in, in the non-private setting? You just do principal component analysis. You take the covariance matrix of the data. It's positive semi-definite, so we can write it down and take the singular value decomposition, uh, which would look something like this. Um, and then what you do is you throw away all of the small, the, eigen, the singular vectors corresponding to the small singular values. So you just keep the top k largest elements, so you get rid of those. And so basically, uh, the top k PCA subspace is the span of the corresponding rows of the of of the V matrix, so this red, green, and blue vector here, right? So you get something that looks like uh, something that looks like this. So far, so good. Great. So why is principal component analysis on its own not private, right? Um, that's kind of the first question. Why why do we have a privacy problem here? It seems like you're learning something about the population or structure of the overall data set. Um, so suppose there are two types of people in the world, right? They're Shannon people and they're Turing people. We all know this is true. You know what side you're on. Uh, and I want to find this uh, top dimensional, uh, this, this, you know, the, the, this top K dimensional subspace in a differentially private way. So I'll suppose that, you know, K is equal to one and there are only two distinct values of, uh, of Xi, Shannon or Turing. So you're either a full Shannon or full Turing. The thing is, changing a single point can change the top eigenvector in this data set by, by 90 degrees, right? By just basically saying, oh, I have N plus one Shannon people and n Turing people, so Shannon wins, v1 is equal to Shannon, or the reverse, I, I just move one data point from Shannon to Turing, that is, I'm changing x to x prime in my data set, one changing one individual, and then I'll get that Turing is the most popular. So if you're in an EECS department, maybe this happens to you. Um, so the point is that this PCA is actually quite sensitive when the eigenvalue gap is small. That is, uh, when these two competing top singular vectors are close to each other, uh, things look like the subspace looks kind of uh, pretty sensitive. So actually, what it raises is the importance of the output space. So the subspace is very sensitive, but the matrix, the covariance matrix itself, is actually pretty stable. Um, and we have some flexibility because of post-processing invariance to choose the output of our algorithm. I'm not required by the language of PCA to say, I want to output a subspace. So, so I don't have to choose the set of all k-dimensional subspaces as my output. I could choose the set of all d by d matrices, or the set of all d by d symmetric matrices, or just the set of all d by d positive semi-definite matrices. And in fact, uh, different proposed algorithms in the literature have all targeted different output spaces. Um, so there are lots of algorithms in, in different the differential privacy literature, some of which I worked on, for uh, um, this problem. Um, one is, you know, add Gaussian noise to the entries of the matrix. Um, you can do that in a way in which uh, the matrix is either the symmetry is destroyed or you keep the symmetry. Um, there are sort of algorithmic approaches, which like the private power method, which kind of does the power iteration to compute eigenvectors and does it in an iterative way. There's a random sampling method that I proposed. Um, then there's the... Um, uh, so what we are proposing, which is uh, adding positive semi-definite noise to the to the matrix, um, and then uh, which has also been kind of looked at in epsilon delta and also epsilon zero setting by other authors. This last one is a paper from AI Stats, which was sort of simultaneous to ours. Um, we have slightly better theoretical guarantees, which I'm not going to talk about here. But um, anyway, but this this table basically compares them all. And it says, uh, you know, by various various whether they provide delta equals zero or delta greater than or not delta non-zero in the epsilon delta differential privacy, and also kind of whether or not they produce uh, a positive semi-definite estimate of the matrix or not, um, and whether or not they estimate the subspace or the matrix. So estimating the subspace turns out to be kind of um, looks worse actually. So what is our so, method? Uh, yeah. So Again, I'm trying to uh, try to see the big picture. So, yeah. so basically, so you give the example of what do you call the neuro image? Neuro, yeah. What did you call? Uh, so you want each. Yeah, they're yeah, MRI. Each user, yeah. So um, instead of each user providing his 
image, do you want to provide the PCA of his image? Or her yeah, image? that's actually a, pre a pre processing step, would be like providing the PCA of the, actually, the whole data set at, the, at each site. Right? It's like, I did a study on schizophrenia. You did a study on schizophrenia. I cannot mail you all the MRIs from the people in my study. OK. Right. So, but what we'd like to do is learn a good way, a low dimensional representation that's kind of good for both of our data sets, or maybe us and our 10 buddies' data sets. Right? But, but you're still looking at privacy from a user, like a single user. Right, exactly. Or? So now each user needs to be guaranteed privacy. OK. But and then, uh, I mean, because I'm not very familiar with uh, yeah. these models. So you don't care about the performance of your because apparently you're doing the global PCA right on all this data or well what you'd like to find is a subspace which everybody will then use afterwards based on all the images from all the yeah, based on all the images exactly and, and so then, what we can do is do some local processing and share our local subspaces and then do a kind of consensus on those so if we can share them in a differential privacy differentially private way. Yeah, so in these type of problems, you don't care about how privacy is affecting the accuracy of your... Uh, no, 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 we do, of course. But, uh, so, but you, a, you just I'll don't... I'll show a plot. I'll show a plot. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, think I, I think I understand your question, and I will come to that at the very end, actually. It will okay, be okay. relevant. Okay. Um, okay, so what is our algorithm? Our algorithm basically says, okay, generate uh, D plus 1 IID Gaussian noise vectors and uh, add those to your data set and then compute the covariance of that. That's effectively like adding ZZ transpose, this Z matrix ZZ transpose, is a, a, has a, is a Wishart distributed noise matrix, and then I just do PCA on that. Noisy matrix, right? And so what I've done is added essentially fake data points, fake Gaussian noise data points to my data set and computed the covariance of that. And that turns out to be uh, epsilon differentially private. I guess epsilon DP should be, that should be epsilon. And also we prove bounds on how good the uh, error is, uh, you know, in expectation for, uh, for this method. So it's really simple, like add Gaussian noise. It's like the best thing you could possibly think of. Only we're adding it to the data set, which is kind of a little bit different. Okay, so how does it work? So here's, the, I think, maybe getting to your question. So now I'm going to plot, versus epsilon, I'm going to plot, plot like the percentage of the, uh, you know, captured energy, that is percentage of captured variance um, by the subspaces that we produce. So the green line is the top one, is, is the adds of symmetric Gaussian noise to the covariance matrix. Uh, the purple line is ours. The green line is corresponds to delta equals 0.1, which is actually pretty large, not very small. Uh, and ours is epsilon 0, so delta equals 0. And uh, on the left side, we have a synthetic data example with just kind of Gaussian data. And on the right side, we have uh, um, a data set from the UC Irvine data you know, repository of data sets uh, called cover type um, with a much smaller delta. And uh, even with this much smaller delta for uh, the green line, we're doing pretty well. Uh, and so we're making a stronger privacy guarantee and kind of getting similar accuracy guarantees. Um, and the other algorithms are not so great, <laughs> including the blue one, which I worked on. So here both one, sad and one. happy. Yeah. Huh? So what is good here? So the green is the best? The green is the best. The green, is, green corresponds to adding Gaussian noise, like uh, symmetric Gaussian noise matrix to the covariance matrix. What we're doing is we're adding Wishart distributed noise to the covariance matrix, or another way of thinking about it is adding fake data points to the data set and then computing the uh, covariance of that. And PPM on those things, what are they? Uh, PPM is the private power iteration, uh, which is uh, using the power iteration, which it, it, on, it, by analysis, the power iteration is very noise stable, but it appears that adding noise within the power iteration can kind of be unstable if you add too much noise. So there's a kind of that's an interesting algorithm question hidden in there. PPML is like a, a epsilon zero version of that, where delta equals zero, and so it's like even more unstable. PPCA is sampling random a randomly chosen subspace, so it's it's like a distribution generates a distribution on the the uh, Stiefel manifold, and uh, uh, samples a random a random subspace which is supposed to have good um, 
uh, good energy. So what, what have you learned from working with real data and synthetic data? So well, what I've learned is that, okay, what I learned, and we did experiments on other data sets too. What you learn from this is that uh, every data set is very different. Um, and uh, there's very little that one can say about, I mean, what, we can say, generally speaking, one algorithm will work, will work better than another. Um, it's not clear how much better. And it's not clear what epsilon and delta you should choose given a data set, like what you can get away with. So that's like big open questions. And this is because the, 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 there is no model for the data, or where, uh, like yeah, because we... because we don't really understand. Like you know, we get you get you get a bunch of data, and you're like, well, you know, and we're a co perfectly happy as information theorists to say like, oh, I'll assume my data is Gaussian, right? But that's actually a pretty lousy model most of the time. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so let me uh, close the loop on this just a little bit. So what we are going we use is to do kind of a round rob use this in a kind of round robin approach to. Uh, do uh, differentially private PCA preprocessing for, for these neuroimaging applications. Um, well, there's lots of interesting questions in sort of these distributed settings, so the like impact of privacy on the feature learning, how much privacy budget should I spend on feature learning versus other things, like later on in the process, um, and also looking at things like uh, how do we think about other functions I might want to run in the data, standard statistical tasks, which we're not quite sure Maybe we know how to do them in a distributed setting, but we don't know how to do them when we're trying to limit the amount of communication. Um, and there are a lot of open, big open challenges, like more complex networks. What can, what should we do when we don't have, you know, like a hub and spoke model for our, our data sharing? Um, and then also, which is kind of interesting from like the people selling data, private data model, right? You know, retail, you know, uh, advertisers getting buying your data from various websites that you visit and so on. So this kind of aggregate tracking is kind of falls into this category. I don't even know quite how to address those kind of questions. Um, and then there's uh, also, you know, uh, the data publishing problem that I talked about in the first part of the talk in a sort of distributed setting. Um, hasn't really been looked at, but I think uh, too much. Uh, Lalita has looked at it a little bit in a, uh, Shankar has looked at it a little bit in a, in a sort of rate distortion setting where you have like different Entities like power companies, which need to share data uh, with each other, and so they're going to publish sort of some versions of their data. I think that's a different different model. Uh, okay, so let me just provide a few concluding remarks because I'm a, quite a bit over time, and I have so I have to go teach in two minutes apparently. Um, so differential privacy, I just want to point out in this talk that the stuff that I've been looking at is really not just, normally people think about it as a method for curated data access. You know, you have a database and you want to answer queries about that database. And a lot of the literature focuses on that. But I think that these two other settings, this local, this local data publishing model and the distributed learning model, um, or distributed learning setting, I'm going to be not model, um, are kind of interesting and raise interesting sort of questions about appropriateness of the model, but also, you know, interesting research questions, which uh, some of which are challenging um, and worth, worth taking a look at. Um, there are other combinations of these sort of local distributed data publishing curated access things. So the local model estimation problem, which is a uh, more uh, parameter estimation problem, was, there's a paper by uh, Ducci, Jordan, and Wainwright on uh, archive. It's an updated version of an older paper the head up before, uh, which looks at sort of minimax bounds on, on parameter estimation in local privacy model. Um, and then there's also problems in like distributed data sharing, like I said before, which I think are, are quite interesting and sort of relevant for looking at um, in society. There are a lot of theoretical questions which are open. Um, for example, uh, guarantees that we can make theoretically about algorithms for continuous data or high dimensional problems or non-IED settings are either, either the guarantees are very poor or non-existent. There is some recent work which is sort of takes uh, some stabs at, at working at that. In particular, there's a paper by Basili and Freund uh, on archive. Uh, maybe Sri knows where where they sent it if they've sent it somewhere, probably Colt or something. Um, then uh, there's also uh, questions of how do you incorporate this privacy models into other ways in which people thought think about the word privacy, like secure multi-party computation, where you have sort of equivocation bounds on how much different parties learn about each other learn about each other's data when computing a function. So that seems very relevant, but they don't there's not been a ton of work that's sort of brought these these two perspectives together. And I have a project where we're kind of looking a little bit at that, more in a implementation setting though. 
And then also questions of how to use privacy measures between that are between differential privacy and mutual information. So differential privacy, upper bounds mutual information, but there's stuff that might go on. There are things that could happen in between, and so there's a paper at CISS this year um, by Isa et al., which looks at uh, which looks at one such measure based on kind of guessing. Um, on the practical side, there's a ton of questions because theoretical guarantees are basically asymptotic, and therefore, you know, depending on how fast the asymptotics kick in, a uh, guarantee that says, "Oh, well, your utility will be really great once you query, you know, 10 billion people." is not very useful because you don't have 10 billion people, um, depending on the scenario. Um, so there's a lot of questions about how methods perform in practice and how to tell which method to use. So that's why benchmarking is important. And then inverting the analysis. So given a data set, what epsilon is possible, that is like not what people have looked at really right now. It's mostly been, let me fix an epsilon and see what performance I get in the terms of a utility perspective. So I think that is kind of getting at your question, Salim, about do I care about utility? Generally speaking, we start with the epsilon and then figure out what the utility could be, and not vice versa. Um, and then, you know, basically testing things out in the field and saying, oh, when is given this leakage over time of privacy, uh, what sort of practical systems actually can we build in which we guarantee differential privacy? There is a system uh, that that is proposed at um, on the, the top here, this rapport system at Google, um, and then there's also this. Uh, initiative at Harvard, the big NSF center, uh, for developing privacy tools under differential privacy for, for doing privacy preserving data analysis. And as a quick plug, I'm also working on a Python package, or rather my group is, um, for implementing some of these differentially private algorithms for statistics and machine learning. And we're trying to develop tutorial materials to kind of let people play around with these algorithms on data sets that they have so that we can do things like, oh, what do I learn from synthetic data versus real data? What do I learn about data in, from one kind of application versus another kind of application? Because the only way we're going to see if any of these methods kind of work in practice or what we need to do to get them to work in practice is to try them on lots of different types of data sets. And so that's where benchmarking um, is really important. Um, so thank you for your attention. And I thank all of the people who have given me some money to work on this, so um, thanks. Yep, thanks a lot, uh, Anand. Um, this was very interesting, and I know you have to teach, so we're going to let you go, and uh, if people have questions, then we can ask you probably through the comments on YouTube. Yes, I will I will be monitoring them. Yeah, and then we're, we're going to end with this fractal image of your screen. No, no, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, Bye. cheers. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for your question.